Hi, welcome to Straight Talk. You know, our goal here is to educate you as much as possible about the opiate epidemic, new drug trends, and try to give you information that can be helpful to you, your family, and in your community, wherever you are watching this show. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit of, about probably the hottest teenage craze going on around the country, and that is vaping and vaping with what's called the Juul. Everyone's heard of this, and now we actually get an idea of what it does and what it is. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that and also talk about the opiate epidemic and a lot of things we're seeing on the streets. And joining us is our, our resident therapist who's just been so helpful to us over the years, uh, Karen Moore, who is now an LCSW, C, yes. which is terrific. Congratulations Thank on you. that. And you're with Amethyst Health. Correct. And they are, provide services in many different states, they too. They do, yeah. So that's great. So welcome. Thank you. It's good to have you. It's crazy. You know, we were just talking before the show. Tell me about these calls you're getting from parents. I mean, the calls that I'm getting from parents are kind of like the, like, oh my gosh, what is wrong with my child? And some of the calls that I'm getting obviously pertain to this is like juuling, smoking weed, drinking very early, 14, 15 years old, mm -hmm. and a lot of parents not knowing exactly what to do with it. I mean, I think the trends have changed where it used to be smoking and you could catch your kids smoking. I mean, it, right. you know, everyone knows that smoking, it smells. The jewel is a little bit different in the sense that it doesn't smell and also people are able to put things in it that they wouldn't be able to put in a cigarette. Um, and so the trends as far as like what young people are doing is really changing and um, they're getting access to things that they wouldn't normally have access to and also do, it allows them to not get caught. Um, because it doesn't have the same smell that cigarettes used to. And, and, and they, they say when you're juuling or vaping pot, mm -hmm. which you can make yes. out of pot oil, and put it in your little vape, that it doesn't smell like pot. Right. You know, like most parents watching are going to say, well, I know what pot smells like because I right. remember when I was in college. But it doesn't smell. It doesn't have that sweet smell. No. It just smells just like vaping. Exactly. So like it, basically they can hide it. And the only indications that you would have otherwise are that your kid might be acting a little bit different. But you can't smell it. They're able to hide it. It's, much, um, it's easier to conceal and therefore they're getting away with it longer. Um, but I have a lot of parents that often like they don't know that it's actually happening. They're just thinking it's happening, which is really confusing. And they don't exactly know what to do um, because they haven't exactly caught them. This whole movement of teens smoking pot has happened in the last couple of years. Do you think this has anything to do with the legalization, the medicalization, the message that's out there about pot being so wonderful and no one dies and no one overdoses and it cures this and cures that? And Absolutely. I mean, if I look at, I mean, I work in addiction treatment. That's been the majority of the work that I've done um, since I've become a therapist. and. A lot of times you'll hear even like some of the, the most like heroin users will say, well, I can smoke weed because first of all, it's going to be legal. Second of all, like, I've never hurt anyone and I've never done anything. And like I might drive actually a little bit better because I drive slower when I've been smoking. Like, you know, these outlandish things that they say as far as like why it would be a good idea to yeah. do it. I, I think we're doing a big disservice <laughs> to a lot of kids and a lot of families with this pro pot movement that's going on because it's filtering down it sounds like to these kids who are not developed yet they shouldn't right. be smoking pot no and i think there's been studies to show that an adolescent brain that smokes marijuana like it does not do anything it's also a catalyst for a lot of mental illness so you'll hear like oftentimes bipolar schizophrenia some of those need they'll get a catalyst like marijuana use and you'll see some of those more problematic mental health issues isn't surface. the pot a lot stronger now than it was years yes. ago much, much stronger. Like you're not, you know, that some of the, the clients that I've worked with will talk about that they feel very messed up when they're smoking the, the marijuana that's out there today compared to what it used to be, you know, say 20 years ago. And parents probably are saying, well, it's the same that I smoked 20 years ago. It's when not, it's, it's not, not the it's same. not your daddy's mm, pot, right? No. The strains are much stronger, um, they're more concentrated. Um, I mean, you ask anyone who's smoking marijuana today, if you compared it, the way they describe it, compared to how it used to be, you know, 20 years ago, it is a very different um, description than I would say if I, you know, 
maybe ask someone in the 70s what it was like when they smoked marijuana. Yeah, I so. mean, it just seems like, you know, we're, we're kind of stuck in the past, but the kids are moving forward and they're paying the price mm -hmm. because now you're getting the phone calls. Absolutely. Now, when pot use becomes a problem, you know, whether it's school or attitude, they need, what, what do you do for them? Like when they come to see you at that level, what, do you, what can you do for them? Boundaries at home. Um, I think a lot of parents don't know what to do or what to say. And because it is kind of permissive or like acceptable or becoming more acceptable in society, like do they do anything? Are my kids just experimenting? So a lot of times their questions are like, how do I exactly address this with my kid? And often I'll say, it's gotta be boundaries. It's not in the house. Um, these are the ground rules. If, we, if they tested them and they were positive, there would be natural consequences to that. And it very transparently laid out consequences for if you use that in the household, what this means for you. Um, so they have some accountability for their behavior. Right, right, right. And it's still illegal. Yeah, it's still it probably, legal. It's not legalized. But, it, but no matter, even when it's illegal, it's not going to be legal for teenagers. Correct. It'll be like alcohol, probably, that there'll be some kind of an age limit. Exactly. So yeah, it's, you know, it'll, it's really hard for the parents. They don't know what to, they don't know what to do with it. I think the kids seem to know more. Yeah. They because, also know how to hide it. You know, I, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I mean, this is the jewel for anybody that's never seen and you've heard about jewel, but it looks like a flash drive. Yes. It looks like it goes right in your computer and then these little pods which go inside are equal to a pack of cigarettes. Yeah. It's crazy. It is crazy. And then it goes in here and they can hold it in their hand mm -hmm. and just hide it. Yep. I've had reports where kids were doing it in school. They do it in the school bathrooms. <laughs> not even not even in the bathroom. Sometimes, you know, that's just like walking down the hall. So But, but this thing is like taking over. Taking it, over. And now originally when they vape, this is nicotine. Mm-hmm. Now if they're vaping nicotine, what's what's the danger there? Well, the, the nicotine, obviously, is that they're going to get addicted to it. Um, I've had a couple adolescents that I've worked with that are very much already addicted to it. And, you know, to describe to them what it's like to come off of that, they just don't grasp how difficult it is. Um, for them, it's cool. So, so they got sucked into this by the jewel and all yeah. the hype that all the kids are doing. They got hooked into being addicted to nicotine, which then... They want more. Right. And so they will keep buying it. I mean, the same, it's the same concept as cigarettes. Sure. Um, they will keep buying it. And it's, yeah, it's become the cool thing to do in the same way cigarettes was the cool thing to do. Um, the only problem is now they can hide things in this that you weren't able to do with cigarettes. Um, so even more concerning for parents. But yeah, they're sucked into the same problem is that they're now addicted to a substance that is one of the hardest ones to get off of, honestly. Right. This is crazy, you know. But when I saw this jewel, and I said, it looks just like a flash drive. Mm -hmm. And then they hide all this stuff. But again, for the parents out there, we're hearing it everywhere, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's about weed, it's about vaping. And like you said, they've, they've got to lay some boundaries and get this thing mm -hmm. going. All right, we're going to take a little break. We're going to come back and start talking a little more about what's going on with the opiate epidemic and what you're seeing in your treatment center. We're talking with Karen Moore. She's an LCSW, she's a therapist at Amethyst, Amethyst Health, and uh, helping us out a lot, so thanks. When we come back, we're gonna keep talking about this drug epidemic, so stay with us, we're coming right back. Hi, welcome back to Straight Talk. We're talking about some of the new drug trends, and we're talking about how, we, how we're doing on the opiate epidemic, and joining me is Karen Moore, who's a licensed social worker, works for Amethyst Health, and helps a lot of people. That's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Let, let's, you know, let's catch up here on this, you know, on the uh, opiate epidemic. You know, we, it seems like we've realized that what's killing most people is the drug fentanyl. Yes. But heroin and opiates from prescription drugs are still creating the addiction. Correct. Is, is, is that the way things look? That seems, I mean, it seems to be the way things look. I mean, a lot of the stories that we hear are oftentimes the, the young adults that are coming in are typically started out with pills. 
um, whether it was through an injury, through mom and dad's medicine cabinet, um, through a friend's parents' medicine cabinet, or just through getting it through another friend who had their you know, wisdom teeth out or something like that. Like you will see there's usually like something that happened that allowed them access to it. And then there is some percentage of those, those kids that experiment that ultimately end up really liking it and end up continuing to use it where others do not. But I mean, there is a, a large portion of people that just, they like the way it makes them feel or not feel. Um, it allows them access to maybe even reducing emotional pain and they didn't even realize that was gonna happen when they took it. And then they, they just keep going. People always ask that question. I, every, every conversation that I have with people, they go, why do people want to take a drug that makes you like be like in a stupor, mm -hmm. you know, like out of it? You know, why would you want to? And people say, when I took pain medication, I was so out of it. Why people like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they 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 like it. I mean, it depends. A lot of the people come with stories of, you know, difficult childhoods or difficult parents or. You, I mean, traumas, there's, there's lots of things that will happen and it doesn't even necessarily have to be big ones. It could even be just divorce, something that makes it hard for them to face their emotions or deal with emotions or maybe a family that wasn't really open with emotions. So when that person finds out that they can numb out the bad, even though they're numbing the good too, they'll take it because um, they don't have to feel pain anymore. They don't have to deal with that life is hard. Um, they get to kind of coast. Um, the problem is that they coast and they stay the same, you know, emotional age that they started, and that's where we see big problems. But meanwhile, they're getting addicted more and uh -huh. more and more as time goes on because the pills you'll need more. More and more. They're tolerance. very expensive, and then they flip the heroin because yeah. it's a little cheaper. It's yeah, quite quite a bit cheaper. Yeah, you'll find that. I mean, I think it's something like twenty-five to thirty dollars a pill, um, and within a, a certain time frame, people will run out. They'll find out that heroin's cheaper, and then they they make the switch. And when they make that switch. It, it then generally progresses. Um, they might, you know, use uh, as I was eventually getting to um, intravenous use through a needle, and that's when it. They, a lot of addicts I work with will say that's when things really changed. When they got into the heroin, mm -hmm. because then, but it sounds like once you get into the heroin, that puts you into this kind of Russian roulette about what are you really buying. That's that's the and then they get the issue. fentanyl and then they die because mm -hmm. it only takes a tiny amount of fentanyl to kill you. Right. They're used to doing their heroin. They're, yeah, they'll do what, what they would consider a normal dose, yeah. not realizing that however much fentanyl is in, in whatever they bought and they don't know it's happening. And you'll, there are just so many overdoses. It's crazy. Yeah. I think it was like 70,000 or so it's Americans died. Unbelievable. From heroin mm -hmm. and, this, and this fentanyl. Yeah. It's, it's, it's absolutely unbelievable. Explain, yeah, addict behavior in the mm -hmm. sense of we know that they manipulate and lie, but that they, if they heard about fentanyl, instead of running away from it, they would run to it. Right. And that's another thing people, the public can't understand. What, yeah. What's up with that? <laughs> I know, like the, one of the scariest things you'll hear working with an addict is when they find out that someone bought, that basically they bought heroin that ended up killing someone and then they went to try to find that dealer because it meant that they were going to have a high like they've never experienced before and they would just hope that they didn't take so much of the same thing happened but they might experience a high that was like none other so they would chase always taking it to the edge of how far they can take it so yeah when they when they find out that someone has something that good so all these do-gooder programs out there that have websites and apps that try to tell you and they have now they have test strips mm -hmm. to show you if you have fentanyl so the reality is that's only going to show addicts where the good dope is correct instead of scaring them right it's, you would think it would be the opposite you yeah. would terrify them um but it doesn't because um, a lot of addicts will tell you they they aren't even like they wouldn't even care if it if it did happen like if it did kill them like they get to the point where like it's if they can get high they're happier than if it ended up overdosing them and they're willing to take the risk they're willing to take the risk they're not afraid of dying or getting arrested or no it's all about the drug it's all it's the drug becomes the most important thing to them so that's all they care about um so they will yeah they will risk their life um to get a high that's better than the last one they had right and, and even though they know because i think everyone knows about fentanyl and what it is right but it doesn't stop them 
from, no. from, do, from going after the better hives, you said. Right. Well, the addicted brain is hijacked. So they, they look at that as like the only thing to survive and they're looking for it to continue to not feel. You have to keep using more and more and more. So if they find something that gives them the high that continues them to not feel, they will take any risk they can to continue that and to not be sick. Because obviously we know withdrawal happens if they right. remove the drug from their right. system. And even um, the Narcan that we use to bring them back, mm -hmm. which is a, a miracle drug that brings them back. Right. It's like a resurrection, you know, we, we bring them back, but many of them will keep using. Oh, I've, I've heard they will literally get Narcan, go in an ambulance, be taken to the hospital, leave the hospital, because unfortunately a lot of times there isn't follow-up treatment, and they'll go right back to using, and sometimes they'll overdose again. <laughs> Yeah. And be, have the same thing happen maybe two times in a night. I've had, I've had some clients I've worked with where that's happened. And I recently read about Narcan parties where okay. it's like a designated driver where one person has all the Narcan and everybody else shoots up. And, and just it, in and case. It, and if they go out, the one person who didn't shoot up takes care of the other one. Isn't that terrifying? That's insane. That's yeah. unbelievable. I mean, you'd think like, no. But it's not scaring them off. No. And no. All, the, all the things we're doing, it, it sounds like, and I know I was going to get into this in our final segment, but we might as well touch on it. We don't have enough treatment for people. No. I, you know, when you talk to paramedics or hospital ERs, they get these people. And then what do they do with them? Right. Yeah. There isn't enough accessible treatment. Would it be better, in your opinion, if paramedics, the police, everyone that's got the Narcan, and you bring them back, if you, if you were able to get them immediately to some kind of a detox center or some kind of treatment center, would that, um, that be course. like the best? It would, I mean, it would be the ideal. I mean, I know they are putting like peer recovery um, coaches into hospitals, which has been helpful in trying to get people to actually seek, seek out treatment, but it, sometimes they don't want it. Yeah. That's the sad part. Well, I do want to get into that in our final say. I want to okay. talk about now that we've got these people who are totally obsessed and they can't stop, what do we do? How do you, how do right. you treat them? We're talking with Karen Moore. She's a licensed social worker, an amazing therapist, helps a lot of people with their drug problems, works for Amethyst Health, and uh, trying to help people. That's what it's all about. So stay with us. We're coming right back and talk more with Karen. Hi, welcome back to Straight Talk. We're talking about the opiate epidemic. We've talked a little bit about vaping. Uh, and now we're gonna talk a little more about treatment. And we're talking with Karen Moore, who's a licensed social worker, works with addicts for many years, is uh, working at Amethyst Health and helping us out. So thanks. Karen, let's take it to that next step. Because okay. you describe, the way you described an addict is they are just obsessed yes. with the best drug they can find. And no deterrent, none of these campaigns out there are gonna stop them from getting the best drug to them, which right. is fentanyl, that doesn't scare them off. Mm -mm. So now you got somebody who ends up with you in treatment. How do you even start to change that? I mean, the one benefit of them coming to treatment, generally if they, you know, if they go to detox first and they're, they're free and clear, there is a, a difference in that person than the person who is coming in actively high and using. Um, when someone seeks out treatment and they have been had the substance removed, they are free from withdrawal symptoms, they are a very different person, but it doesn't mean that they're safe from returning to use. In fact, you know, the majority of people go through treatment multiple times before they actually get recovery, if they even get recovery. Mm -hmm. um, so to, to start is basically just really assessing like where they are like how ready are they to actually change you will get some people that are like i am so done like they've overdosed however many times their families are are no longer even speaking to them and there's others that are like it's i just i'm i'm not there yet and they've had some of the same consequences so it's it's very individualized where people stand on how they're feeling about getting sober so it's really a matter of are, are they ready are they not ready where right. they are on some kind of a scale yeah, we have, then, yeah, as therapists, we have a scale of like the readiness of change. 
um, and that can change. That that can change throughout the treatment stay um, as they as they work on some of those underlying feelings that they've been avoiding at some of those potential traumas they've had. As they work through those things, some of them do find that the ones that are very unwilling in the beginning become much more willing as they start talking about the issues that are underlying some of the, the reasons that they want to escape their life. I, I don't understand why we're not opening more treatment centers. I don't get it. I'm, I'm, that one just goes over my head. Mm -hmm. Why we're not investing in treatment, but we're investing in Narcan and lots of other things that have proven not to be as, as successful. Right. But when you talk about treatment, in your opinion, what is the best, what would you like to, if you had an addict for, for a year, two years, and money wasn't an issue, what kind of treatment plan would you set up? As long as possible. As long as possible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the problem is though, insurance is, is a, a factor, right? So if the insurance doesn't cover it, um, it makes it really difficult to, to keep an, uh, a recovering addict long enough um, to get them as clear as they, they can be and to get them to address those issues. It is not a, a 60, 90 day process. Usually that is just the beginning right. where they can't even really do the work that's necessary to, to sort of look at those underlying issues that you really need six months to a year. And, um, and getting them off the street in some kind of a residential setting yes. is safer. Absolutely, yes. It's hard, I would imagine it's pretty hard to stop if you're going back to the same neighborhood. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of people when they go to treatment, they, they end up out of, out of the state or out of the area that they were from because it is triggering. They're around the same people, they're around the same places where they got drugs. Like it's, you know, it makes it really difficult. So a lot of people will leave the area that they came from. Um, the problem, they, they also go back after treatment to those right, areas too. Right. And that's the other part of aftercare and mm -hmm. what happens after. And, you know, I think it's, it just seems like that the government and, and a lot of people haven't caught up with understanding that need to keep somebody in treatment for a long time, preferably off the streets yes. where they can really just focus, focus on, on the recovery. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard to get that time. Um, I think there's also, you know, a misunderstanding as far as what happens with addiction and why people continue to literally lose their life. Oftentimes it gets to that point or destroy their families. Like why they keep doing that um, is because they, they and, and you don't want to give them time to heal, right? Because it's their fault. Um, so I think it's hard for people to grasp that like when someone is addicted, they're they're kind of incapable at that point of making rational choice. Their brain becomes only wired to, to feel like it survives only if it has the drugs or alcohol. And so to, to remove them from that and to, to teach them a life without it takes a really long time. However, when someone does get into recovery, they are some of the most hardworking, um, intelligent, kind, um, amazing people but it takes time for them to, to get to that part of themselves. Because um, they were probably that way before they used drugs. Course. And the drugs turn you into whatever. Mm -hmm. And then to be able to get off. But it's, it's it, like you said, it's, a, it's just a hard road. Right. And then we were talking earlier about you know, the Narcan and the, the problem is that like a lot of them, we hear of a ton of overdoses you know, in, in the treatment center that, I work, that, it, that we work in. And the problem is that there is no real treatment follow-up either because their beds don't exist or because they don't want to go or there's a, a myriad of reasons. And so people end up constantly overdosing with no follow-up treatment, which is really, really important. Yeah, and, and even the ER. Well, listen, once again, you've informed us probably more than we really want to know, but people need to know. They do. That's, that's the thing, so thank you. You're welcome. Karen Moore from Amidus Health. She's a licensed social worker. She's a therapist, helps a lot of people, and helps us a lot in getting this information. So hopefully, once again, we're trying to give you information on opiates, on the new craze of vaping. And again, if you know someone that needs help, please make a phone call, do something to help them. If you need help, as Karen said, take that first step to try to help yourself. So I want to thank Karen. Thank you for watching Straight Talk and we'll see you next time. If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction, reach out to us. We are available 24 hours a day. 
Visit us online at amethystrecoverycenters.com or call anytime at 833-754-9297.